It's raining. <laughs> Did you notice? Sometimes the aperture, meaning the little lens that's on the computer, the computer that's on the camera, makes it brighter than what it really is. And I use the auto features because it's easier to do with that than it is to try to. In fact, one of my middle plans took a hit than to try to do something with changing the light settings. It doesn't seem to work when I do that. Although I just now changed the density to be high def more so. And that may work or may not. But I like to do things in video that aren't professional because then it makes you realize that we're all in process. We're all in development. We're all being changed and made into the image of Jesus. We never arrive in this life. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of polished ministries out there. And to be honest, <laughs> it's not hard to look that way. It just takes time. And I've done that. And worked at different things and worked in different ministries where, yeah, it's, it's cool. You look good. Feels good. Shines. But I always found I was content and contented and found great contentment in being kind of more down home. Down to earth. Rough draft, so to speak. Roughing it out. You know, kind of struggling with you rather than talking to you. You know, that's where I'm at. Because quite frankly, I'm struggling with you. I'm going through the same things that you go through. And that's what Jesus said when he came down to the earth, that he was tempted in all things and yet sin not. He went through the same experiences that we go through. Because he had really more going against him than we do. Oh, we have a lot going against us. Things we can't see that are always manipulating, in some ways, our life. There are principalities, and those are just giant areas of just massive influence. Kind of like, you know, democracy. Democracy is like a principality. It's a massive area of influence that gives you a certain amount of rights and privileges that, quite frankly, you haven't a clue how to use. Because democracy is not theocracy. Democracy is the opposite of democracy. I mean, theocracy, yeah. And so, one is led by God, the other is man-driven. Wow, imagine that. Or we should say mass-driven, crowd-driven, people-driven. So, one of those giant principalities influences you where you live today if you live in a democracy. Now, if you live in a kingship, uh, autocracy, then you have one person in charge. They're a little more easy to deal with. You see, when you have an autocracy, you can change the king's heart. You know, it turns every which way it will. But when you have a democracy, it's kind of like a mess. You've got a whole mess of people that are in messed up conditions that are trying to figure out what to do and how to act. Now, some people think we have a autocracy because they like to blame someone for the state of America. Well, it's not really that way. We also wrestle against things that are called powers. Now, those are interesting because they're in the world and they influence us behind the scenes without us knowing. They are things like money, the free enterprise system, the areas that influence us emotionally and cause us devotionally to distract us from the place of doing what Jesus said or being like Jesus said. Those things that are powers like that will kind of like, you know, pull you and sway you. The power of love, you know, worldly love that is, you know, it kind of pulls you away from loving the Lord your God because it's like, wow, look at her. And suddenly you're interested in what she is for you, not what you really can offer her. Not really. Same thing with powers is like, it kind of gets you in the, you know, ego stage. 
you know, the world's got this power over you that wants you to be you. You know, the best you. Humanism, you know, I am I. And I am master of my own destiny. I am creating my own world. I am choosing my own fate. I am manipulating my own accomplishments. I <coughs> have a super ego. And so, a power is like puffing you up with pride and it's pushing you in certain directions. It's like having peer pressure. The power behind peer pressure is there. It is a spiritual thing that we don't see, but they're there. Some people call them angels, some people call them, you know, a type of angel or a type of hierarchical angel. There's spiritual wickedness that goes on. That's obvious. You know, I mean, there's things that are, hey, you know, they're Christians, but they're kind of wicked. You know, they just, they know better, but they're still doing it. I can't figure that one out either. But the point is, you and I, back down on our level, because we have to deal with normal life, some days when it's raining, some days when it's sunny, we really can't tell up from down. Because we don't really know the whole story. So, the reality of knowing the Word of God helps us to understand part of the story. We begin to appreciate that there's more to life than what we can see. There's more to this existence than what we know. There's more to being a Christian than sucking your thumb or sticking your fingers in your ears or reading your Bible. There's a lot more to it than just simply praying, oh yeah, I, I'll make it, you know, sweet by and by with my eternal security. There's actually relationship. You know, that kind of thing that you do with God and you do with you and me. It's kind of like where we are when it really boils down to in process. We're in the process of learning how to deal with each other. You know, I love to see how people get together and how they deal with each other. You know, one person goes, another person goes, another person goes, another person goes, Go figure. But we're all in process. And what we see, what we hear, what we do often influences the process that we go through. And so a lot of people are influenced by television and how they see people deal with each other on television. They watch some TV show that has relationships in it, and so they become like that. Oh, not on purpose, but it influences them whether they'll admit it or not. And gradually they become like that. For instance, no one ever heard of a man cave until it was on television. No one ever heard of man talk until it was on television. As propaganda or news or television or those things that influence us by what we see and hear began to influence us, we began to do those things. It's kind of like how come when there were almost no tattoos, suddenly tattoos exploded on the scene? It's pretty obvious. Tattoo TV shows came up, and all of a sudden there was like 300% increase in tattoos, tattoo parlors, people getting massive amounts of tattoos done. Of course, the Bible says don't get yourself tattooed, but okay, you know, choose what you will, and walk which way you will. But the process of learning means that we are all in process. It means I may see someone that may be just got saved and they're full of joy about their little bit they do know or a lot that they've learned. Who knows? I don't. But God does. So as they are going through this process of development, they're learning how to deal with me and I'm learning how to deal with them. It's called relationship, and it's a process of sort of give and take, kind of like communication. You learn how to listen as well as to speak. That's kind of like give and take. You ask a question, you wait for the answer. You listen, you ask. You interrelate. You interpolate. What that means is simply that 
if a person asks you a question, you answer their question. And then the person may ask a further question to learn more, discover more, or try to comprehend more. Because none of us really know each other. We can't crawl out of our own skin and get in somebody else's skin. We use the expression, walk in another man's shoes, kind of goofy-wise, you know, to say, well, you know, you haven't walked in my shoes, so you don't know. Well, the Bible says, yeah, we do know. You know, God knows. Man looks on the outward things, but God looks on the heart. God knows, literally, everything about you. So, he has said, I don't care what it is about you. I want you to demonstrate that you are mine by how you treat other people. Now, that doesn't sound so good. That's kind of like one of those things that you go, uh-oh, you mean like the people that I go to church with? Well, yeah, that's one. Uh, you mean like my, my wife? You know, the one I divorced? Well, yeah, that's one too. You mean like... Um, my kids, you know, well, yeah, that's one. You mean like the way I treat the government? Yeah, that's one. The way I treat the president? Yeah. The way I treat my enemies? Yeah. Well, you see, that's why it's called a process. Because you're in process of becoming more like Jesus. <laughs> and I hope not less. And that's what we all have to think about at times. Are we becoming more godly or less? Godly. Are we allowing those things to come into our life that are distracting us and causing us to go in different directions than possibly being made aware that rather than standing out in the rain, we need to come in under the shelter. We need to go inside where it's dry than to stand out in the rain where it's wet. God looks at us the same way. He says, look, you can do it your way. I don't know why you would, but you can. You can go your way, do your own thing, and enjoy the fruit of your labor. If you think it's good, go do it and try it. And if it works out for you, great. But you know, if it doesn't work out for you, then you discover that maybe, maybe God has a plan that's better than what we understand. You know, God's plan, better than we understand, kind of rhymes, doesn't it? It makes sense. Because... He already knows you. He's already seen the beginning from the end. He already has the knowledge if we would ask him for it. So, I find that as I'm learning this process of life, as I am in the process of getting to know God better, I'm getting to know you better, and you're getting to know me better. And sometimes that process isn't such a nice thing. You know, once you see something in the person, you know, that's in process, you might not like what they're doing. Ugh, yuck. Well, don't do it. But that doesn't mean that they're not in process like you're in process. You see, God is in the process of changing you, of making you into His image, the same way He is in the process of making someone else changed into His image. You may take your eyes off of Jesus at some point in time and look at another person and go, Ugh. and that's where the problem is. Because you're not looking at them as a person in process. You're looking to process them. In other words, you're looking to evaluate them. You're looking to say something about them rather than to see them as God sees them. And God sees each and every one of us in process. We're not the finished product. We are being changed slowly. We are developing daily. We are coming into the knowledge of God acutely by our experiences of life. And so the person you were yesterday probably isn't the person you are today. And as much as I might think I know you, I don't know what you're going to do in the next step along your way of learning about God. Because He's in the process of teaching you. So you may learn how not to do whatever stupid thing you just did or smart thing. You may have to unlearn some things in order to get with the program, so to speak, and to be part of the process of development. Because that's really what God wants to accomplish, is development in your life. He wants you to be a full, accomplished person. He wants you to have an abundant life. A project that is accomplished is often like 
a construction project. When you have a construction project and you go in to build a bunch of houses, until it's completed, it looks like a mess. You'll see the framework go up, you'll see the foundations being dug, you'll see the piping being put in, the electrical going in, the insulation, the roofing, you'll see it all happening at different times in different ways. But the reality is there's a plan there. There's a purpose, there's a design. And once the entire community of that housing project is done, it's ready to be occupied. God wants to occupy himself in you as he's redeveloping you as a housing project for his spirit. He is inside you, oh yeah. But he had to do some zoning changes. He had to turn you into a construction project because quite frankly, you were more like tenement housing that was like dilapidated than you were something that he could inhabit. Because when he came and he saw, he said, you know that tent you're in? I got something better for you. Instead of living in a tent, how about we build something for you that will last eternally? Now it means you're gonna to have to give up that little physical tent you got, but I'm gonna give you a spiritual construction project that's going to last forever. You're going to take it with you into heaven where you will continually know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you will not be unhoused or some kind of ghost wandering around in the wilderness or some kind of spirit that's detached from a body. No, I am building you up. I am constructing in you a habitation. I am the Lord your God, maker of heaven and earth. And God works that way in a construction type of way to make us into what he wants us to be. I know it sounds a little confusing, but if you put it in construction, it's pretty simple, really, because you're a housing project, and you will be completed one day. But until you are, you only have a portion of what God intended all of you to be. So in the process of development, in the process of your living out your life, in the process of seeing other people that are in process also of being developed, don't think that the project is done. No, it's just begun. Until the day you die, you will always be changed. You will always be learning. You will always be evaluating. You will always be kind of like seeing a better way to do something. You may have, as it were, single pane windows, like I do, sort of. You know, they're kind of like, I'm not sure what kind of pane they are, but they're sure a pane because <laughs> they don't hold any heat and they don't retain any whatever. But the point is, a double pane window is fully insulated and it keeps the cold out and lots of times keeps the heat out. Well, Praise the Lord. To adapt to that, I can make changes to it by putting up drapes or by adapting other things like a little mesh blockage for the sun and put in other things to block the cold or to heat the house. And so there's always improvements that can be done instead of getting by with, you know, building fire, you know, and sitting outside the tent, you know, and trying to camp out in the middle of a rainstorm. I don't think that's such a smart idea. But when you move into a new dwelling place, you expect there to be comfortable arrangements for your living situation. And isn't that the way you want to live your life as a Christian? Comfortably, fully equipped, fully stocked, fully housed, completely adapted to the arrangements that God has foreordained for you to live in that you would be prepared for those things that are coming upon the world as well as in your life, that you wouldn't have to reconstruct your building again, but that you would be able to live in what God has given you. That's why you're in process, because this outward tent you're living in has an inward construction project going on, and you are that construction project. God is developing you into the person, into the building, into the habitation of the Holy Spirit that he wants for you to appreciate once you move into that dwelling place that he is because you have become the dwelling place of God. Now he's doing a construction project in you to make you able <laughs> to dwell with him in his place as opposed to your place.